Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! As you'd expect, we're picking up on the implications of the terror attack at Westminster, and given where it happened, it's more poignant than usual having as our main guests. Uh, two MPs, Sarah Olney, not long arrived at Parliament after winning uh, that by-election in Richmond Park, of course, and Theresa Villas, Conservative MP for Chipping Barnet and former Northern Ireland Secretary. Um, both of you, of course, elected representatives at the heart of this story. In the debate uh, that followed, quite striking, you raised the issue, uh, Theresa, about arming police and giving them arms to those that aren't trained to use them. W what were you saying there? I was saying that it's important to reflect on whether there are any lessons to be learned about our security. And I was sort of, I think we do need to give some thought to whether all officers who are protecting sites known to be of interest to terrorists sidearms for their own protection. Obviously, they'd need to be um, trained to use them properly. Well, they'd have to have a basic sort of training in them, then, would oh, they? Absolutely. But they're not part of yeah. the firearms squad. But you're, in effect, saying that every firearms officer or just those that are going to be at key sites? Uh, my, I think, in looking at this, we need to focus on these key sites. I'm, I'm certainly not advocating sort of widespread arming of, of police officers. And, and actually, another alternative for officers in Parliament is whether more of them should have tasers. That might have been useful for the, the two officers at the gate at this incident. I wouldn't say that at this stage, you know, we should rush to conclusions that the, the lessons learned to, are clear, but I think we need to reflect on options like arming police officers who are not armed already in Parliament. Sarah Oli, let me ask you this, just if you can remember, I mean, an ob observation before what happened um, uh, this week, did you have any sense about you or have any thoughts about the fact there were unarmed officers on that kind of one entrance? Um, well, I think Theresa's right, it's a bit early to say what the lessons to be learned from this particular incident are. Um, I would say that most of the times I've used that gate, generally the officers there are armed and that is pretty much in line with, with what I would expect. So um, I think it's quite surprising that this particular officer wasn't armed on this occasion and maybe that's something that needs to be looked at. Um, but speaking personally, I'm not in favour generally of greater arming of the police. I mean, I see armed officers sometimes on the street, sometimes at the station, and I don't find that reassuring. I find it unnerves me to see too many firearms on the streets uh, as part of routine patrols. And have you, have you felt completely safe in the houses since you've arrived? You've, you've arrived there and you've just thought, wow, this looks heavily protected, highly protected. It's never, it's never been an, uh, a, a matter of concern for me at any time before. Um, all, the, all the police... Uh, and I, I can't speak highly enough of the way the police reacted on Wednesday. I mean, they were absolutely fantastic, the, the, the care they took of us. Uh, and Theresa Villas, obviously, because you bring us, I mean, you'll bring an extra knowledge about this because you'd have gone through all kinds of, you know, stuff in your position as, as, as Northern Ireland Secretary, but have you ever had doubts about the security at the uh, Palace of Westminster? I've always felt very safe in the Palace of Westminster, just as, to be honest, I feel safe in London as a whole. It is important for everyone to recognise that whilst this has been a horrific tragedy. Thankfully, these attacks are very, very rare. The likelihood of someone falling victim to terrorist attack is very small. And do you have London. that sense, if you're honest, that uh, the nature of it, very, very difficult, ultimately, is a difficult truth, but can you guard against what actually happened without stopping people driving anywhere? Or I'm afraid it is impossible to prevent every single terrorist attack. We have some of the best police and intelligence services in the world, and they on a daily basis, I think, are, are preventing terrorists from carrying out their violent plans. But it is simply not possible to prevent them all, particularly the sort of low-tack attacks of this sort. Well, let's uh, continue in the, uh, the same vein. Earlier this week, uh, before what happened, the mayor had just published his official plans for policing in the capital. Counter-terrorism specifically among the issues, of course, but wider concerns are revealed about the impact, for instance, of financial cuts, as Tanjil Rashid reports. This was a week in which the Metropolitan Police's efforts to keep Londoners safe was put to the test. One officer dying in the line of duty in the attack on Westminster. Since August 2014, the capital had been on the second highest alert possible, and experts who believed a terror attack on London to be inevitable were proven right on Wednesday. The reality is 
um, having looked at this in detail, um, you know, only a few months ago, this was something that clearly we had to expect in some form. And I'm pleased that what it looks as though all the emergency and contingency arrangements seem to have clicked into place. This all raises questions about London's counter-terrorism policies, which were highlighted this week in City Hall's Crime and Policing Plan. It states that counter-terrorism policing begins with community policing, and there will now be an extra police constable in each ward, up from only one PC and one community support officer at present. A further 600 armed officers are being recruited, and some of them were visible at the scene this week. An online hate crime hub is being set up to allow the police to investigate the use of the internet to abuse and harass people. The mayor supports the use of intelligence-led stop and search, although the plan expresses the concern that if you are black and minority ethnic in London, you are two and a half times more likely to be stopped and searched than white people. The report also cites the greater pressure on the Met's budget. It's had to make £600 million of savings since 2010, with an additional £400 million to be cut over the next four years. With the Met Police in charge of fighting terrorism nationally, will the government reconsider its plans to reduce funding for London under its new funding formula, as the plan stated only two days before the attack? Should the worst happen and an attack happen, it is essential that the Metropolitan Police Service has the resources it needs to respond rapidly and protect the city. Uh, essential indeed. Uh, Sophie Linden is the Deputy Mayor for uh, uh, Policing and Crime, working very closely with the Mayor, of course, on that. Um, welcome to you. Uh, has the Met got sufficient resources to deal with terrorism? Before I do answer that, I just wanted to pause and remember the victims of the awful, horrific um, attack on Wednesday. Not just those that died, such as Keith, uh, PC Keith Palmer, but also those that some of which are, you know, really seriously in injured and probably have some life-changing injuries but also to pay tribute to the police and the emergency services because they stepped up to absolutely. Their response was robust and really, really should be uh, admired. We, ha we do have the best policing service in the world. In terms of resources, again, I think it's too early to, you know, I don't want to get into that at this stage in terms of counter-terrorism. We, you know, the police absolutely acted in the way they should have done. When the mayor went to COBRA, chaired by the prime minister on, on, on the Wednesday of the attack, um, they were given reassurance by Mark Riley that they had the he had the resources that he needed in order to the respond to this attack. Assistant attack. Yes, the acting assistant commissioner. The acting assistant commissioner told Cobra and the Prime Minister that there were sufficient resources. You agree with that? Then there are sufficient resources to deal with counterterrorism. Mark Rowley, who is in charge of counterterrorism for the country as well as within the Metropolitan Police, reassured the Prime Minister and the Mayor that he had the resources that he needed in order to, you know, respond to this terrorist so attack. So you're reassured, so you would presumably go along with that, that London has, the Met has enough resources to deal with counterterrorism? He, in terms of counterterrorism, he reassured them that he'd had the, so the resources. So do you go along with that? What do yes, you absolutely. say now? What I, do you think? Do you have reassured. enough resources? On counterterrorism, as Mark Rowley said, that he has the resources he needs to respond to the attack that happened on Wednesday, as he as he said at Cobra on Wednesday. So, are there enough armed officers? In terms, I think it's um, it's too early. You know, we absolutely have to learn the lessons of Wednesday and look back after and let the police do the investigation. It is an ongoing investigation into what happened and making sure that they know all the known associates of the attacker. But in terms of um, in terms of making sure that we learn the, learn the lessons and do we have enough firearms officer, we need to wait and see. But the Mayor has already announced, as you saw in the Police and Crime Plan, that we will be increasing the number of firearms officers on the streets. Yes. Whether we need more, we, we'll have to learn the lessons. And then this key thing about putting another police officer back into every ward, mm -hmm. the 630 wards in the capital, so there will now be two police officers and one PCSO, a support worker. Mm -hmm. Is that enough? Are you quite happy with that now? That is community policing restored to a reasonable level. Our commitment and the Mayor's commitment is to ensure that by the end of this year that every ward in London will have at least two, two police PCs and one PCSO. And in some areas where there is more need, more demand or higher crime or higher vulnerability, there will be the ability of the borough commander to put more extra PCs into that ward. And is that so enough? You've got the resources for that, which is a key... We, we have the resources. To absolutely, we wouldn't have made that commitment unless we could deliver it. So, so as we look at this, because um, you say and the Mayor says how important that um, community policing is to terrorism, it's 
it's the eyes and ears. As we look at it, London is sufficiently well funded, we can hear this from your, uh, your own mouth, uh, to deal with the, the policing and terror challenge at the moment. And the reason why I ask, I know, you'll know, is because the mayor often likes to give the opposite impression that obviously more is needed. I think in terms of the counter-terrorist attack, I don't, I don't wish to get into the funding issue. Because, and as Mark Rowley said on Wednesday and gave that reassurance, in terms of counter-terrorism and responding to the attack, he had the sufficient resources. Wider strategic issues about the funding of the Metropolitan Police going forward, you know, we have, we have said we are concerned about that and we will continue to make sure that we, you know, London gets its, the resources. I just wonder, is it, is, it just kind of, is it just sort of meeting the, the propriety of the time that a mayor or you as a deputy mayor don't question and don't go on the attack politically about the lack of funding because we have just seen, you know, the capital, you know, But we're fire still, attack. London is still, you know, it's only a few days since the, that horrific terrorist, terrorist attack on, on London, on, you know, at the heart of our democracy, Parliament, and on really innocent victims that are coming, coming for, you know, tourists in London. I don't wish to get into the argument and into the debate about funding for counter-terrorism, um, but in terms of longer-term strategic funding, we absolutely we need to make sure that London has the funding it needs. Sarah Olney, has the, have the police got enough uh, resources? Are you feeling confident? Um, that's not for me to say. I mean, Sophie's obviously just uh, You'd like to have a view locally. You're a MP of a local area. Do you feel if someone chose to target your area, you have the policing, you know, um, the eyes and ears in place? Um, I've got a really good relationship with our local borough commander. I meet with her often to talk about sort of policing issues. I mean, Richmond generally is quite, um, it's quite a low-crime area. We have certain uh, specific issues that particularly concern us there, but it's, it's not a high crime area. It's not, uh, it's not somewhere that has big problems with gangs or with drugs or something like that. I'm very confident in our local police. And you're very management. content with the resource levels as far as you see. You're not getting complaints from people that they haven't got up from your local police, they haven't got enough resources. I'm not hearing that from them directly. Theresa? Counter-terrorism is obviously a, the, the highest priority for the government, which is why the, the last uh, spending review devoted considerable additional extra resources, I think it was about 500 million. Also, there has been a very big uplift in the capacity of the intelligence services. I think in the security review, there was a commitment to recruiting 1,900 more people. So. Um, On the counter-terrorist side, you feel content. If I was taking you back to your, we take you to your constituency and the eyes and ears, the community policing element, restoring, do you, do you lament and regret the loss of some of these um, local community police officers under the last mayor, Boris Johnson? Well, of, of course, we, we still have our neighbourhood teams and they are absolutely essential. They're much been, smaller now, they're half been, the size, weren't well, they? Well, there have been to... changes over the years yeah, under the last mayor and, and the present mayor. It's vital that we retain those neighbourhood teams. It is also worth re recalling that spending on the police across the country has been protected in real terms over the course of the spending review. I tend to think that the mayor doesn't devote sufficient resources to the suburbs. I'd like to see a shift of uh, officers from inner to outer London to reflect our population. But I think overall um, it's, it's Im vitally important to recognise that spending on the police is, um, has been protected in real terms at a time of severe pressure on the public finances. It's been protected. You've got protected funding. Again, we're hearing that. Um, but perhaps you're hearing here that we should be dedicating more money to the, to the suburbs, to the outer London. In terms of there's the protection of counter-terrorism, as I've said, in terms of that, we, you know, there is the, there is the resources there to respond to attacks. In terms of long, you know, in terms of the other element of policing for the Metropolitan Police, certainly have seen previous, previously some diminution in the local local neighbourhood policing that we are re, we are putting back. And in terms of the suburbs, there is um, in terms of outer London, the uh, the resources are demand led, and that is a formula that the Metropolitan Police put in. It isn't a political decision in terms of where the money goes. It is around where the demand is where there's vulnerability and actually I think if you look London is changing and shifting and some of that demand is shifting out to outer London and some of those resources should be you know should follow that okay well um, thanks very much indeed for coming Thank in you. Now, shisha bars have been proliferating in the capital in recent years and some councils are getting increasingly concerned. Should they be subject to stricter licensing conditions? Are some of them dangerous even? Brent Council is calling on the government for more powers to close down the worst venues. As Dan Friedman reports. It's one of London's fastest growing nighttime activities. But shisha bars, where people can smoke flavoured tobacco through a water-cooled pipe, are not regulated in the same way as restaurants, clubs or pubs. And authorities say there's a growing minority that are becoming a magnet for criminals. We've had 
murders, attempted murders, GBH is violent disorder, phrase, all linked to these venues. Many of them uh, are lawless, um, they are unregulated, and that's why we're trying to get them closed down. They're making lots of money, but we have no idea where that money goes. We also have evidence that it's linked, or these venues are linked to drug misuse and drug dealing. A lot of these venues are death traps. You know, they are chained up, the fire exits are chained up. Here in Brent, in a pattern that's repeated right across London, there's been an explosion in the number of shisha bars opening over the last few years. The council say there's now around about 50 altogether and that at least four-fifths of them are in some way breaking the law. These are four separate incidents of violent disorder associated with just one venue in Brent. It's now temporarily closed, but the council say their powers are limited to three-month closures and fines of up to £2,500. They say what they need is the ability to close problem venues down for good. Well, if you imagine uh, a pub or somewhere that, somewhere that was selling alcohol or food late at night uh, that had some really bad associated uh, antisocial behaviour problems, we would have the power to licence them. We would have the power to, to not issue a licence to a premises where there was persistent bad behaviour, so to speak. We don't have that here. The longest that we can uh, close somebody for is three months and we find ourselves essentially in a game of cat and mouse with the owners. I think there are a smaller number of premises where there's really serious breaches happening, um, but you know, up to a quarter of them really are, are areas that we would consider closing. Um, and so it, it's really about the problem being more intense in some of them. Nevertheless, the degree of non-compliance across them generally is a massive concern to me and we need a licensing regime to keep them in check. In terms of the most serious ones, we'll be working with police and it's really important that we have the powers to deal with this before somebody gets killed. Not everyone agrees. If there is actual evidence of crime, there are laws in Britain to prosecute the criminals and they should be pursued in the right fashion. But the idea that a venue generates crime is really problematic and we've been challenging that. However, crime isn't the only concern. In neighbouring Barnet, they've run a poster campaign to highlight the fact that shisha smoking is just as bad, if not worse, for your health than smoking cigarettes. Back in Brent, and one of the borough's best-run venues says he wouldn't be averse to tighter regulation. It all comes down to management in the end of the day um, of the place, how you want to manage the place. Do you want to manage it in a way where you want to make money quick and you know don't really focus so much on, on repetition and, and about quality, then that's the way to go. And, then, and obviously you expect with that, you expect the crimes to go up, you expect um, bad publicity for yourself. The Home Office say police and local councils have an extensive range of powers available to deal with premises that are causing nuisance or disorder. But many believe that unless something changes, this hot topic won't simply drift away. Uh, to do this, I think you've been, have you been part of a campaign at Barnet to try and prevent, is it one in particular opening or a general concern about them? I, I've been briefed on the campaign that the councils run there, which is part of their public health campaign. I think it's very important for people to understand that uh, shisha bars are, you know, this is very bad for their health, just as bad as... It is a health smoking. thing, is it, purely? They just don't want to see them at all or just trying to discourage many of them opening? The, um, my understanding is, is the focus is on um, encouraging people not to um, not to do this because of the health concerns that are you know on a par with smoking. And from what you know, do you think there are sufficient powers then? If if we're hearing someone like Brent Council saying they can only close for three months, but they can't close for longer, their feeling is a disconnect with their licensing powers over establishments like this. I think even you know less power than they have, for instance, for for pubs or licensed premises like those. Obviously, this it, it sounds like a serious problem. So, I'm, you know, I'm sure the Home Office will reflect on whatever repre representations they get. But <laughs> there seem to be a lot of options in terms of antisocial behaviour orders and these kinds of things. It, I'm not sure that the solution is yet more offences, yet more laws. It seems to me that enforcement and use of some of the powers already available might be the best option. And Liberal Democrats, you know, are, are, are concerned about individual freedoms as well. And we've heard mm -hmm. how <laughs> policing isn't a problem out in South West <laughs> London. I don't think shisha bars are in Richmond, are they? We They're have one or two, yes. you know? <laughs> um, Do any issues raised for you about... Um, uh, uh, the lack of licensing powers around them and if they're proliferating both for, for health reasons and because they appear to be places where there's public disorder. 
Um, I mean, I haven't heard that from my own constituency that it's it's causing a problem. But uh, to me, I think I would be a little bit troubled by the idea that we wanted to target one type of business with uh, and, and and prevent people running a business which, as long as it's well run, it doesn't cause a nuisance to other people. Um, I don't see why they should be subject to to um, additional license. And a slight cultural thing here that it might appear some people would not you know, will take against it because it looks like it's. I think you know, there's a risk that it could be yeah, perceived like thing, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. Um, I think that's a risk, and that's something we should consider carefully if we want to... Yeah, let's bring you rules. into that debate, Teresa, because <laughs> if it is a cultural thing and there is a danger there of interfering with something, and it could be seen as targeting and cause a kind of backlash, couldn't it? It's obviously important to focus on premises which are a problem for their neighbours, but they... You know, the authorities must obviously take an objective approach. Then I don't think it would be right to target one particular type of premises. They should only really take action where you know, rules are being broken and crime has been committed. OK. Well, now it's that time uh, for the rest of the political news in 60 seconds. London Sharia Council has signed up to a new code of conduct. All rulings will be recorded in English. The primacy of English civil law is to be reinforced and better religious training for scholars will be put in place to prevent harmful cultural practices that force women to return to abusive relationships. The ultra-low emission zone, which the mayor plans to introduce by 2019, will affect London's emergency services. There are more than 800 police, fire and ambulance vehicles that will breach the ultra-low emission zone rules. The fire brigade fears the zone will cost it a quarter of a million pounds a year. NHS chiefs have spent £17 million on consultants hired to draw up plans aimed at plugging the hole in the health service budget. Bosses reviewing services at five sites in south-west London spent over £4 million on management consultants. A report from the King's Fund, a think tank, last year said that some managers felt under pressure from NHS England to use consultants. Uh, Sarah, um, police cars or ambulances or fire engines, should they be exempt or should they have to pay if they're uh, breaking the ULES, you know, pollution restrictions? Oh, I think they should be exempt, but we should certainly be looking as far as we possibly can when we're looking at uh, replacing the fleet to be uh, replacing them with, with low emission alternatives. Should they be exempt or should they be forced to pay it because that would make, encourage them then to, to make the changes necessary to their fleet? They should certainly be encouraged to make the changes to their fleet as soon as, as it's affordable, but I think um, we do need to, to be pragmatic on this to inflict a, a very big new charge on the emergency services might be difficult. What about the, his wider plan? I mean, this plan to extend the ULES right up to the North Circular and the South Circular, is that going to hit too many people, do you think, too soon? I, it's important that it's properly consulted on um, because there, if, if businesses are potentially affected by a significant new cost, um, I think we need to take some care. Clearly, action is needed in London to clean up our air. It is a significant killer. But we also do need to recognise that we shouldn't be inflicting unnecessarily large burdens on small businesses. OK, well, we're London. running out of... Um, <laughs> rapidly, I see you nodding in agreement. No time <laughs> to say any more about it. To you both, though, thanks um, very much indeed for coming in.